All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on what part of the world you are joining us from. I am your host, Alex Faust, and very honored and excited to have Herman Simon joining us for conversations at the edge again on a very important topic, which is inflation and how that impacts your pricing. If you're not already familiar with Herman and haven't read or watched any of his work, Herman Simon is the founder and honorary chairman of Simon Kutcher and Partners, the world's leading price consultancy with over 40 offices in 24 countries. He's been ranked on the Thinkers 50 list of most influential international management thinkers and is considered the world's most foremost authority on pricing strategy. He's published over 40 books translated in 27 languages, including the worldwide uh, bestsellers Hidden Champions and Confessions of the Pricing Man, which we have as a learning suite inside the Edge. And today, I'm very excited to welcome him back to Conversations at the Edge for a very timely and important conversation about inflation and how we need to be thinking and reacting to inflation in terms of our pricing. So, Herman, welcome back to Conversations at the Edge. Where are you calling in from today? Hi, Alex. I'm calling in from Bonn, Germany. We have wonderful weather, but the economic situation is not that wonderful with these high inflation rates. Yeah, very much so. Well, it's, it's great to join, have you join here. And just a reminder to the folks who have joined us live, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat or the Q&A. The last 10 minutes, we'll get to your questions as part of today's event. So you know, I want to jump right in, Herman, and I'd like to maybe just set the stage and ask, why are we experiencing these extremely intense rates of inflation and kind of how did we get here? It actually goes back to the financial crisis of 2008 and 2010, when the money supply grew for the first time on, on a very large scale. And uh, this scale of the expansion of money supply has even been larger during the COVID-19 crisis. So during the last two years, so too much money is chasing too few goods. In addition, we have a couple of uh, further factors. We have pent up demand. People have saved more during the crisis and now they want to spend some money, be it on travel, on consumer goods. We have um, problems in the global supply chain. Think of this um, ship which blocked the Suez Canal and then on top of all of that, the Ukraine crisis with uh, oil prices is exploding. So this is a very serious situation that we have five, six factors which drive places, prices up, which uh, stimulate inflation. And can you help us kind of understand the relationship between what's going on, the factors impacting inflation and pricing strategy as it uh, pertains to you know, businesses who are in the mid-market? The starting point from a company point of view are the purchase prices. Uh, it's not only energy, it's electronic ships. Everything goes up in uh, our purchase prices and that creates a squeeze on profit margins. Then we have the demand side and the competition, and that is decisive. Can we afford to increase our prices in order to defend our margins? And that is a big challenge. We, we have no choice. We have to increase prices if we want to defend our margins and our profit. But the question is, can we do it or do we fall off the cliff? And so what are some of the mistakes that you're seeing executives making in today's inflationary climate? I think the two most important mistakes are that companies increase prices too late. So costs go up and they wait a couple of months to see what's happening. They are shy to increase prices, afraid of negative consumer re reactions. And that means that they are losing margins over a period of three, six months, and that is going to destroy the annual result. And the second mistake is that they raise prices too little. We, we just did a study with several hundred companies, 
And they said on the average, they pass only on 41% of the cost increases. That means they absorb more than half of the cost increases. Of course, this is hurting profits and uh, this is a very bad strategy. Yeah, and it seems fairly complex because you have to balance, obviously, you know, your margins and also what the customer is willing to pay. So I'm curious, you know, about, about number one that you said the number one mistake was the speed of increasing prices. So what are your recommendations in terms of how quickly companies should be moving to make changes? Should it have already happened? You know, are they too late already? Or what are your thoughts there? No, it has already happened, but uh, the cost increases have been underway for several months by now. And for instance, uh, the largest uh, food retailer in Germany, Aldi, the discounter, uh, which is also Aldi in the US and uh, uh, Trader Joe, uh, they increased 160 prices last week. And most of the other retailers follow so it's late relative to the cost increases. It may be not too late, but many other companies and other industries are still hesitant, are uncertain, and uh, are simply afraid to increase their prices because this means tough negotiations with their customers, especially in business-to-business -business markets. Can you talk about um, what kind of like due diligence an organization should be doing to, to make price increases, what are the factors that we should be looking at and how do you kind of roll that out inside an organization? First, you don't have much time, but you must understand the consumer. And the consumer's behavior has two uh, contradictory aspects. First, with increasing prices, the consumers become more price sensitive. They still want to get products at lower prices, to get bargains. On the other hand, they are confused because inflation means that prices are changing all the time. So the consumers use, lose their price anchors. And it's actually easier to increase pricing during inflations due to this lose of, uh, losing of the loss of the price anchor. Uh, and companies have to understand the consumer. How does the consumer react? If you are on, on the internet uh, in e-commerce, it's quite easy to do some tests in a normal retail shop that's more difficult, but the basis is to understand the customer. And when you talked about before, mistake number two is not raising the, the price is high enough. Do you go for the full 100% increase of your costs in relative to your pricing? Or is there a balance there that you recommend we look to? You cannot generalize that. Of course, ideally, you would strive to get your costs back to keep your profit constant. We are talking about so-called phantom profits, which is another tricky issue. But we see that in different markets, consumers react very differently to price increases. So it depends on your specific market. In theory, we call that the price elasticity. If the price elasticity is high, you cannot pass on the costs to the full degree. If the price elasticity is lower, for instance, for products which are less frequently bought, you may be able to increase your prices 100% relative to cost or even a little more. Actually, you should try to do a little more to avoid uh, or compensate for so-called phantom profits. Can you talk a little bit about phantom profits? I had intended to get to that a little bit later in the conversation, but yeah. now it seems like yeah. it's a good time to attack it. Yeah. Let's assume your costs increase by 10%. And you are able to pass this cost increase on to your customers so you can increase prices by 10%. Then your revenue goes up 10% and your profit goes up 10%. So you say, oh, that's wonderful. I have a profit growth of 10%. But that's only in nominal terms, in inflated money. You should look at your 
profit in real terms. So if you adjust it for your inflation, you have no growth at all because everything has gone up 10% and money is 10% less valuable. And there is another very tricky point in that. Your depreciation is on the historic prices. So on the machines you bought, you bought five or 10 years ago, but you have to buy new machines at higher prices. So in this phantom profit, there's something which is not real and something which is not enough for your reinvestments to keep your machine park and your equipment up to date. And so you actually would need more than 10% price increase to compensate for these effects. And my advice is try to go rather a little higher than to be too low relative to the cost increases. And so when we look at you know, machinery, are you looking at the historic prices? Are you looking at the prices in today's market in terms of the balance sheet? Your depreciation, so the money which you do not have to pay taxes for, is based on the historic prices. But for your price calculation, you should use the future prices or the current prices. But uh, of course, you have to pay taxes on the, on the phantom profit because the difference between historic prices and current prices is not uh, accepted by the, by the Internal Revenue Service to be deducted from your uh, profit numbers. That's a very tricky issue. Yeah. So I want to also talk about the role that competition has in inflationary times on pricing and just business strategy in general. So I'm wondering mm-hmm. if you can touch on the role of competition. Competition is, of course, key. One aspect is very important. If all competitors have the same cost increases, then it will be much easier to increase prices because they are all under the pressure. If some competitors have lower, others have higher costs, that's very difficult. That could be the fact that they come from different countries with different inflation rates. And of course, you can only increase your prices if competition follows or comes along. And there, the role of the so-called price leader is very important. A price leader is a company which goes ahead in price increases and the others follow. For instance, I mentioned Aldi, in, in the German retail market, they increased their prices last week and most of the other large retailers follow. So they accept the role of Aldi as the price leader. Uh, this is a system which, uh, yeah, which, which works with, without agreements or cartels, which are of course forbidden. And uh, you, it, it's good to have such a price leader, which is, recognized by the others and has the courage to go again. Because that's also a risk for the price leader. Uh, If the others don't follow, the price leader is in trouble. And we have seen cases where they had to take back price increases because uh, the others didn't follow. But that's generally easier under inflation. So under inflation, the, the main problem is not the competition. It's more the cost side and the consumer. And when you think about the price leader and having pricing power, does that role, your your role as a price leader in the market change during inflationary times? Do the strategies change? Ideally not. I mean, if you really have pricing power, that has an extreme value during inflation. Uh, Warren Buffett was uh, the guy who really pointed the intention, uh, the attention of shareholders to the role of pricing power. He said, pricing power, the ability to increase your prices without losing volume is for me the most important criterion in evaluating a company. And of course, under inflation, when you are forced to increase your prices, Pricing power is extremely valuable because it means you do not lose market share, you do not lose customers, you do not lose demand. 
Can we talk a little bit more about the balance between increasing prices and demand and how, you know, we should balance what a customer is really willing to pay um, and what we're able to actually afford pricing wise? Yeah, the willingness of the customer to pay is uh, the key criterion there. And uh, companies, managers are afraid that they lose volume. And in our study, which I just mentioned, we found that about 30 to 40% refrain from the necessary price increases because they are afraid of losing volume. But that is the wrong perspective. Your orientation should be the effect on profit or ideally on, on, on real profit, not on these phantom profits and not on volume. And uh, if, you, if you don't increase your prices and keep the volume, you are certainly much worse off than if you increase your prices. So defend your margin and accept a certain uh, percentage in, in volume losses. So uh, being oriented towards volume and, and defending volume is the, the wrong position during inflation. Your, your view must be profit, ideally even real profit and not only nominally, nominal profits. Yeah, and I, I mean, you were talking about that prior to this inflationary environment. And for the, the folks who are here live, I recommend watching Herman's course at the edge. He talks about having that profit first uh, kind of mindset rather than being so focused on volume and, and market share. So if you have an opportunity, it's a, it's a great course to, to watch during these times. So Herman, you know, one of the things that you sent me prior to today's conversation was your 10 commandments to go against uh, inflation. And number 10 on that list was stay on the ball. If inflation continues, don't chase it, but adjust your prices at short intervals. So if inflation is going to continue over the, the near future, can you talk a little bit more about the increments in which we should be looking to uh, adjust our prices? Yes, inflation means that pricing change continuously and, and frequently, much more often than under stable price conditions. And this means you should follow this trend and adjust your prices frequently. If you lose time, it's difficult to catch up. And what we observed is that about one quarter of the companies in our survey from last week say they change now prices several times per year. Of course, we have systems with dynamic pricing where prices change all the time, like in, uh, in air tickets. Um, but in the normal markets, you often have traditionally one price adjustments per year. Now you should go to quarterly price adjustments and have the price increase in smaller steps than in one huge step per year. So you have to prices to change prices more frequently and in smaller steps to keep up with inflation. If you lose time, it's difficult to catch up. Thank you. So there are a bunch of questions already coming in from the community. And one that keeps popping up is how do you justify the prices to the customers? Is there a wording strategy for approaching clients uh, for, I mean, maybe it's unforeseen, but it's probably foreseen at this point, given it's happening everywhere. So curious about if you have yeah. any recommendations there. That's a good question and uh, frequently asked. And if you view it from the point of uh, view of the customer, customers tend to accept only cost increases as uh, justification for price increase, increase. Even referring to the competition is difficult. If you say, oh, the competition increases price, so we have to do it too. They say, why do you have to do it too? So in almost all cases, you have cost increases and you should use this as an argument. And you should not use um, the argument that to say, oh, demand is increasing. And obviously our product are seen as more valuable, like uh, 
emergency products under under emergency situation. This is not uh, an argument uh, which bodes well with customers. So the best argument is cost increases. They usually accept that. That is both true for business to consumer and business to business. Any thoughts on like increasing, you know, finding ways to increase value to justify uh, justify the, the cost increases? So not necessarily blaming it on the, your costs, but more so we're going to add more mm-hmm. value to what we're delivering? I think that's a very good strategy, though it may be difficult under inflation. But what you could do, you could uh, throw in some services for which do you, you do not charge, uh, home delivery or, or whatever it is. So I think increasing your value has two advantages. One, you deliver more value than your competition. And second, the customer has to pay a higher price, but he or she also gets more. So if, if that's possible without driving the costs up, I would advise to apply this, this method. It's a very good one. Great. So we have another question from the community uh, in a B2B set contract pricing arena. What approach or negotiations would you uh, recommend using when changing prices? Yeah, that's, of course, very difficult if you have a contract which uh, expires only in a year from now. Uh, there's not much you can do. You can try to negotiate because your customer may also understand. Your position may understand that you are in, in danger of, uh, of going bankrupt, uh, of not being able to deliver. If you can uh, recur to force majeure, like uh, when, the, when the ship was blocked in Suez Canal and you don't get parts, that, that may help you. Uh, but beyond that, you could also try to offer more value and say, okay, can we increase the prices 5%? We need that. And I offer a little more value. But in, in terms of the hard contracts, there's no way to get around this. Very yeah, difficult situation. I, I just uh, had a discussion with a, a, a large meat um, producer who sells to the big retailers and uh, his procurement costs have gone up. Of course, the ideal, you must practically have that if you are a professional, is that you have uh, price gliding clauses, price adjustment clauses, so which say if you're Uh, purchase prices go up, that uh, your uh, selling prices also go automatically up. Otherwise, it's uh, it's too risky to run a business where uh, you you may be squeezed between purchase and selling price. And John, if if you're needing negotiation strategies, Victoria Medbeck's book, which I have right here, Negotiate Without Fear, could be a, a great resource yeah, uh, if yeah, you're needing yeah. to. Yeah. And work since on you your are showing a book, Alex, uh, this is my newest book, True Profit, where I also deal with the phantom profit uh, issue in detail, which is a very important aspect in uh, just appeared a few months ago. True Profit, no company ever went broke turning a profit. Simple sentence, awesome. but true. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So we have another question here uh, from Dale. Why don't companies invest more in pricing strategies? It's had the single biggest imp- direct impact on bottom line yet, and most simply have a cost. And yet, most simply have a cost plus model. Not sure what the yeah. last part means. <laughs> what are you? What are your thoughts there? That's true. I mean, that's what we have inherited from history, and. I call cost plus pricing Marxist pricing. Why? Karl Marx, the guy who invented communism, he had the so-called labor value theory that value is only created by the labor put into the product or the service. This is, of course, nonsense. Uh, If you uh, produce a steam locomotive today and invest a lot of labor, nobody is going. No railroad company is going to buy it. 
value is determined by the customer, what we call subjective value today. And this is uh, the cost plus and Marxist approach is a totally wrong approach to pricing. Why? I've been asked a thousand times the following question. What is the most important aspect of pricing? And I always have the same answer. It's value to customer or more precisely perceived value to customer. Why? Because the customer's willingness to pay is nothing but the reflection of the perceived value. And so I can only give the advice to all of you, give up cost plus pricing. It, it seems certain because costs are, are hard numbers, but it's a totally wrong approach. Adopt value-oriented pricing, oriented pricing, which means, of course, you have to understand and you have to quantify the value you deliver to the customer. Thank you. Uh, Allison is asking if I can share the Ten Commandments document that you sent to me. Uh, yeah, is it okay you can if share I send them. that? Out? So, yeah. if anybody yeah. wants that document, uh, send me an email, Alex at growthinstitute.com. Yeah. Or I can share. Uh, you can also post it if you want on on, on LinkedIn or somewhere on on your page. Yeah, feel free okay. to do that. Great, will do. Thank you. Um, so we have another question here from Michael. We're in a very price sensitive market. And if we increase our prices based upon the percentage increase in our costs, we get huge pushback. For example, the cost of fuel has increased exponentially. Should we look at the cost per mile change as opposed to the percentage increase in fuel? No, that's both, both approaches are, are possible. Uh, I think they are about equal. Uh, that's another case. If you are very uh, oil or energy intensive, you should have a clause in your contract that if the energy prices go up, you can uh, increase your price accordingly. We have transportation companies which have these clauses and, and, and they are getting along relatively well and the companies who don't have these clauses are really in trouble now. Uh, so there is not really a short-term solution, but for the future, you should uh, put that into your, your contracts or your offerings. Great. Thank you. I'm curious, uh, Herman, what do you see as our moral responsibility to mm. consumers in terms of pricing during times of inflation? I uh, see two moral responsibilities there. The first one is you cannot avoid to raise your prices if you want to survive, but you should remain fair. So you should not abuse a position of shortage, uh, a monopolistic uh, situation, an emergency, etc. which we also very often see that there is an emergency and, and uh, merchants... Uh, double or triple their prices. So I think in ethical terms, uh, it's unavoidable to raise prices, but you should remain decent and fair vis-a-vis -vis your customers. And they will honor that in the future. And they will punish you if you abuse a temporary uh, shortage. And the second moral responsibility is to work hard on the cost side under these conditions. Uh, if, if prices go up and people don't have more money, you cannot assume that you can pass on all the costs. So you must be more efficient, reduce costs. And uh, in our study, uh, there was an interesting comparison. I said already that 41% of the cost increases could be passed on by the companies but 17% come from higher efficiency. So if you add the 241 plus 17, you are at 58, which they get back uh, partially from the price increase, partly from the higher efficiency. You will not get back 100%. So is 58 enough? Uh, that's, uh, I cannot say in general, but it's both components, price increase and uh, cost cutting must uh, be applied in this situation. I think these are two moral responsibility of company leaders. 
Thank you so much. And Herman, as we wrap up today, um, you know, I think I've learned a lot. I'm sure our community has any final words or uh, recommendations to pass on to our leaders as, as we close out. Yeah, I think under these circumstances, uh, having solid information, really understanding the customers are even more important than, uh, than under normal stable conditions. And uh, we would be happy at Simon Kutcher to help you if uh, you need us. And uh, it's a challenging time. Yeah. Thank you so much, Herman. It was a pleasure getting to speak with you again. Um, and for those who want either the Ten Commandments or any of the other resources, please feel free to email me and we'll be posting them uh, both on the learning platform and uh, on our social channels very soon. So Herman, thank you so much. Thanks to the community. Hope everybody has a great rest of your day and uh, we'll see you again next week. Yeah, You are welcome. Thank you, Alex. Take care.